So this is a walkthrough video for analysis one. What I'm going to do today is um, just step you through the assignment, talk a little bit more about what it's intended to um, focus in on, some strategies and tips for choosing what um, uh, what texts you want to analyze and how you can get the most out of this assignment. Um, and then I'm going to step you through actually completing the assignment. So I will. Uh, I'm not going to write the entire essay online, but I will show you how I collect data, how I uh, would complete this assignment, um, show you what that coding and markup stuff looks like, um, and then uh, the kinds of arguments you might uh, pull from that data. So as you already know, um, especially if you're finding this video, um, you can access your assignment prompts over in the assessment folder in Blackboard. Um, this is analysis one. So what you're meant to be doing in analysis one um, is a comparison between your own prose and someone else's prose. So it says here a professional writer. Um, there's not like a hard and fast definition of exactly what that is. Um, what you should be thinking about here is kind of a, an aspirational target. So somebody that is more advanced in their writing career than you are. Um, it does specify here pros. Um, and the reason that it does this is because the data we're working with here is um, um, it's just not going to work with poetry where you're really messing around with sentence structure um, in ways that um, can really get in the way of successfully completing this assignment. Um, about 300 words, it can be shorter. Um, I would say don't go a lot longer because you're just gonna be making more work for yourself, but you need to have a decent sized chunk just so you have enough work to analyze. Um, this first paper, as it says here, it's intended to help you focus on concision um, and hopefully through that to increase clarity. Um, you're going to be collecting data about those two writing samples um, and that original data that you've collected is going to form the basis of your argument um, alongside your reading of the, the pieces. Um, as it says here, you can use fiction or non-fiction prose. Um, try to control those variables. Um, so that you don't have too many differences will set you up for an easier comparison. Um, these metrics really are targeted towards um, workplace academic um, type genres where that clarity thing really matters. Uh, not the clarity thing, the concision thing really matters. Clarity pretty much always matters. Um, where concision matters. Um, if you're thinking about using fiction, um, one thing that I'd say is that uh, writing um, where you're trying to convey a lot of action, where things are moving pretty fast, um, is according to my creative writing colleagues, um, uh, a type of creative writing and fiction writing that would benefit from these strategies, from this kind of concision focused work. Um, in both cases, uh, I would say, like you should avoid picking text that has other people's voices in it. So if we're thinking about um, reporting, we're thinking about um, fiction, um, trying to avoid stuff that has like dialogue and quotes in it, and also with academic writing, trying to avoid stuff that has quotes in it. And the reason for this is just that when you have a quote or you have dialogue, it's meant to sound like somebody else, right? So if half of your writing sample is meant to sound like somebody else, then you're not really going to be able to make a claim about what you sound like or what your author sounds like. Um, you're just going to be giving yourself um, less data to work with. Yeah, so have a think about what it is that you want to get out of this assignment, what it is that you would like to work on, um, and pick your texts accordingly. You know, if you are really focused on tightening up your academic writing, maybe choose uh, an assignment that you've written for another class and an article, uh, maybe maybe even one that you cited just to see what the difference is. Um, if you're interested in journalistic writing, maybe you have um, 
you know, a little article or a blog post or something that you've written, you could compare it to a news article. Um, the idea here is that you can uh, figure out what it is you want to work on. Um, and I want to just emphasize here, and I'll probably say a bit more about this at the end, um, is that the point of this is not to say, well, obviously the professional's writing is better. Um, the writing is going to be different um, for a few different reasons. Um, notably, you're probably writing for really different audiences and you're probably making different choices as, as a result. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that most published writing has benefited from having a lot of different sets of eyes on it. Um, maybe it's been co-authored, maybe it's been edited, um, maybe it's been peer-reviewed, um, whereas your own writing maybe hasn't had that extra, that extra assistance in it. Um, the point of this assignment is to analyse the strategies that are being used um, in order to meet the writer's goals and address to an audience. Um, it is not meant to be an opportunity for you to beat up on yourself about, oh my god, I'm terrible. Um, because you're not. Okay, so let's um, step through this. So you've got your two um, pieces of writing. You'll download chart one from the assignment folder. So here it is. You can just right click and save as. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, you will need to create copies of your two passages for analysis. Um, so depending on um, the format that you have these in, you could copy paste, you could um, uh, need to retype them. Uh, it's up to you. Um, and again, here's one I prepared earlier. Okay, so I made the entire walkthrough video. Um, but also I got confused about the difference between screen recording and movie recording in QuickTime, which I'm notorious for doing, but normally I work it out faster than I did today. Um, which meant that I have an entire walkthrough video with just my face and none of the text um, accompanying it. So what I'm going to do here is just try and recreate it. I'm going to do a very um, daytime TV. Here's one I created earlier because I did uh, spend a heap of time making my problem one and we're getting towards the end of the day and um, and towards dog walking time, uh, which they have a lot of opinions about. Um, I am also sitting here with a puppy on my um, lap, which is going to get in the way of typing a bit. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through um, coding some of the sentences in here. I'm not going to do all of them. Um, I'll then, I've got the completed one, um, so I'll be able to show you the completed one. Talk through some of the observations that I'd make out of it. Um, uh, just so you can see some of the, some of the, um, the way I think through this, the way I make these identifications, um, some of my decision making process, um, but also to do this in a quicker, more expedient way. Um, okay, so what we have here is um, two writing samples, one from my colleague and friend Colin Bjork at Massey University, um, one from me. This comes from a co-authored article we have coming out shortly with some uh, other colleagues. Um, and it was recorded as a verbal interview, which we then edited uh, for publication. Um, it is from an academic journal. Um, and so it has some of those characteristics of academic writing, but then uh, also informed by the medium that we produced it in. Um, because I've already done this once, I've already broken a bunch of this stuff down. Um, so for example, we have our sentence links, uh, Colin Bjork Beck. My sample has my name on it. Um, number of sentences in my sample is 15, number of sentences in Colin's sample was 11. Um, uh, for those longest sentences, we just did that with um, uh, words, word count. Um, so you can just select it and it will turn up uh, down here at the bottom. Just be aware if you've already numbered your sentences that it'll be one too high. So this is, it counts the number basically. So 17, there's actually 16 words in this sentence. Um, 
so the longest um, I'll pop these in afterwards. Um, the longest sentence in Collins was, uh, I want to say, 28 and 5, four words, the shortest sentence in his. Um, mine was, I want to say, 35 and then 5 averages. You all know how to do. Um, and then let's look at some of this, um, some of this coding. Um, just to practice identifying it all. And again, you'll have the full set of coding. I'm just going to do a few sentences here just so you can see how I do it. Um, and then I'll give you the full data set and work, walk you through that. So I'll come down to my, um, my sample here. Um, we're starting with our main or lexical verbs. Um, so this is row six here, the number of main verbs. Um, you can have multiple main verbs in a sentence and many sentences will have more than one main or lexical verb. Um, so I'll just do a couple sentences for you. So immediate, immediate response was the verb. Um, if the problem with translation is that it's, it is not the student's words. So watch out for those contractions can throw you off a little bit. It's not the student's words. Are we not concerned that the outline isn't the student's ideas? Um, a couple of things to note in here. Translation, uh, a nominalization from the verb translate, have that noun making morpheme on it. Um, shin, translation. Similarly, response. It's got a verb. It comes from a verb, respond, but it's working like a noun there. Um, Coming down into this next sentence, choosing what to include in a part of a docu in a document is part of the writing process, but also part of demonstrating subject expertise. Um, so I am just going to mark up the non-finite verbs here in blue. So these are verbals. They look like verbs, but they're not doing a verb job. You're not asked for these, but I do kind of highlight them in the walkthrough video because they're a place where people really commonly get confused. Stuff that looks like verbs but isn't doing a verb job. Um, so for this one here, choosing looks like a verb because it's got that ing on it but it's not acting like a verb. Um, and similarly to include, anytime you see to followed by an uninflected form of a verb, so not changed for tense, anytime you see to plus a verb um, it is uh, an infinitive, not working like a verb. Um, so it doesn't count for for this. Similarly, demonstrating and writing there are all not doing verb jobs. So in the sentence, we've actually only got one verb. Choosing what to include in a document is part of the writing process, but also part of demonstrating subject expertise. Um, participants made that choice too. So you go through and you'll do the same thing for each one of these sentences to find your main, your main verbs. Um, so every single main or lexical verb in every sentence. Um, for our to be verbs, remember that there are eight forms of to be. Be, am, is, are, was, were, being, been. I always write these down and post it note next to my desk helps me with this. Um, I've just copy pasted them in here. Um, I've underlined these here because um, one of the things you'll be looking for, you can see here, we're looking for the total number of uh, times one of those forms of to be is used. And then here we're looking for them, how often they're used as main verbs. So underlining and highlighting don't clash as formatting. Um, so finding all of them, um, my immediate response was, if the problem is this and is not the student's ideas, um, are we not concerned? So you can see here that's being used to set up the question, are we not concerned? Um, and it's a helping verb for concerned. And don't forget when you have a question, the helping verb can be further apart from the, um, from the main verb. Choosing what to include is part of the writing process. So go through and find all the forms of to be. 
um, every single time it's used. At the next row, you're looking for the ones where it's used as main verbs. So here, what you're looking for is of the stuff you underlined at that last step, how much of it is highlighted. So you can see here we've got underlined plus highlight, form of to be being used as a main verb. Um, uh, down here in our question, underlined plus not verb doesn't count in this row eight. This will do the maths for you just to see the percentage, the comparison of them. Um, so a key thing to note here is that um, we use uh, forms of to be as linking verbs, right? So when that is the main verb in a verb phrase, it's often where there's a lot of description or um, where we're making equivalencies and identifications. Um, and again, you've got to look at the text to see that. Um, for our prepositional phrases, so we do this in week six, prepositions and prepositional phrases. Um, prepositions are our relationship building words. Um, so they establish relationships between things. A prepositional phrase is a preposition plus its nominal object. So uh, a noun, gerund, uh, pronoun, etc. Um, so I'm going to highlight these guys in pink. Um, uh, my immediate response was if the problem with translation, so again translation like we talked about is a nominal with the preposition plus its object. It's not the student's words. Oh, we're not concerned that the outline is in the student's ideas, not there. Um, choosing what to include, again an infinitive. Sometimes people get confused and think it's a prepositional phrase but it's not. Um, it's an infinitive. In a document, in plus is noun phrase, um, part of the writing process of plus its noun phrase, but part of demonstrating subject expertise. So prepositional phrases are descriptors. Um, one thing I'll highlight here, I'll just go down one more sentence, um, really common in academic writing especially to use prepositional phrases um, in order to uh, do citations and introductions, um, introductions to claims. Um, and you can see that here in the Groves and Munt study Bronwyn mentioned. Um, this one is um, citing something that one of our other collaborators said elsewhere. Um, yeah, when you have a ton of these, it can get in the way of um, readability. Sometimes people just keep layering stuff on. Um, and it can kind of hide the point of a sentence, again, depending on the effect you're trying to trying to get. Um, for sentences where the kicker is actor, what you're looking for here, um, when we're talking about the, the kicking, the action, what we're talking about is the most important verb in the sentence. Um, here it's a little bit squirrely because we have a lot of words that could be used in multiple ways, right? The most important, yeah. Um, the main point of the sentence versus the main verb in a verb phrase or the subject of a verb versus the subject of a sentence can get a little bit squirrely. Um, so what we're looking for here is the number of sentences where um, the central action, um, the most important verb in the sentence, has its subject before it. Um, so this includes our active voice sentences with action verbs and it includes our sentences with linking verbs. Um, doesn't include anything that's in the passive voice. Um, and for these uh, sentences, all of these were in both samples were um, had the kicker as the actor. Um, the number of sentences where the action is a form of to be. So here is where you're looking for um, something like this, um, where the main verb in the verb phrase for that most important verb is a form of to be. Um, what kinds of, um, yeah, what, how often is that happening? And here what that's signaling is again, kind of the proportion of description versus action um, that's happening, depending on the genre, depending on the style, depending on what the content will affect what kinds of verb choices you're making there. Um, and again, this will um, 
fill in for you. It'll do the maths for you. Um, for uh, these three rows, 16 through 18, what we're trying to get at is how long does it take a sentence to get to the point? Um, so what, um, how often are we seeing stuff, um, kind of these long rambly lead-ins, um, and how often do we need them? So uh, again, I'm prefiguring all that coding I already did. Most of these um, sentences really do get to the point pretty fast. Um, one standout bit is this long prepositional phrase here um, in the Groves and Munt study Bronwyn mentioned. Um, and then we've also got like occasional puppy head on keyboard. Um, occasional little um, kind of linking words uh, through here. So um, Yeah, so for me looking at it, um, it's really a judgment call as to necessary for text coherence. Um, for me looking at it, I would say that this little citational phrase is necessary for text coherence um, because it um, is, if you take it away, it changes the meaning of the, of the sentence. Um, like it doesn't make sense. Like who, which participants, you can't know that without that introductory phrase. Down here, if we're thinking about like upstream or we're thinking about these introductory words like but, we can often tell that from the context. Um, there's like extra information, nice to have, but not necessary to have. Um, so for me, I would say these two aren't necessary for coherence, whereas this one really is in order to make sense of it. Um, and again, it'll do the maths for you. So let's do the, here's one I prepared earlier. So I have my completed coding over here that I did earlier. Um, and you can see I have also marked some of this up with some of my, um, some of my thinking through as I did this. So some explanatory comments, somewhere it was like, this is what I, this is what I think about it. Um, and I've done both. Um, both sets of text um, and then over here um, here is my here's some I prepared earlier text um, so some things that I would kind of note through here um, let me just make that a little bit smaller um, so that you can still see me um, Yeah, so um, looking at these things, um, I'll just talk through the data at kind of a high level. Um, you can see that I picked um, slightly different word lengths, it uh, doesn't really matter, um, number of sentences per sample. Um, this data really stands out to me around um, sentence length versus um, longest and shortest sentence lengths. You can see there's colossal variation between the longest and the shortest sentence in both of these, especially in mine. Um, you can also see that the average sentence length is a bit like skews lower in mine than in Collins. At the high level, what this data gives you is a sense of the overall variety um, in sentence length in the sentences. Um, what it doesn't give you is a sense of what's really going on in the text. Um, you know, you can get to that average um, in a lot of different ways. Looking at this, you don't really know whether there's like a lot of really long sentences and a lot of really short ones. If there's just one really short sentence used for emphasis, one really long one where the sentence got away from you and then everything else is around the average. You can't tell this from that data. And this is where the data overview by itself isn't enough to support an argument. Um, you actually do need to go to the text and take a look at it. So if we're looking at those long and short sentences, um, you can actually see that those really short sentences are being used different ways uh, by the two of us in this. So Colin's got these two really short sentences, sentence two and sentence nine. Um, and he's got one pretty long sentence 
but a lot of them, even just looking at it, you can see um, a lot of them are kind of similar lengths. Um, they're really short sentences, uh, statements, um, and they're really direct statements of fact, right? Sentence two, writers write for audiences. Full stop, end of story is kind of the vibe that I get off that. So too are AI writing tools. Um, uh, again, like here is kind of that announcement slash pivot. Um, those really short sentences look really different in my writing. Um, and you can see that, again, just looking at the shape of this writing. When you zoom out, you're not even looking at the words yet. You can kind of see the way that we have these patterns of really short sentences, multiple short sentences together. Um, my shortest is actually two. Who benefits? Two. Um, yeah, I always catch stuff the second time around. Um, yeah, you can see that we've got these really short sentences being used repeatedly. They're always questions. Um, and that's part of like the effect that I'm trying to produce here is kind of like pushing you to think on something versus like announcing what I think. Like you need to reflect and have a and think about these important questions, right? Um, uh, where I have those really long sentences, and you can see them in here, um, is where I'm kind of introducing those those facts and some of that argument and like did you know this sometimes it's kind of an interruption in that reflection what are the assumptions here's some um and you can see the way that i'm kind of layering a lot of different information into those sentences um in order to bring that length through um and this would be something that i would probably talk about in the essay so again in my first one um that pattern is really striking and there's a fair bit to say about it. Um, and that's why um, this is one that I'd probably talk about in my essay, just because, um, yeah, it's kind of pronounced data. Um, they're being used in really distinctive ways um, with distinct purposes. It has a distinct stylistic effect, like it sounds pretty different. Um, and what it's asking the reader to do is pretty different. And so that's something where I feel like I could have quite a bit to say. Um, looking at the um, number of ver number of main verbs, um, this is actually kind of a signal of sentence complexity. We haven't talked about this yet. We will, um, and you'll talk about it in analysis too. Um, but you can see in both, you know, there's more verbs than there are sentences. Um, it signals that there's a fair bit of information going into both sentences. Um, one thing that sticks out to me again as a big difference here is sort of the proportion of um, how often we're using forms of to be. Um, you can see it's happening a lot more in my writing than in Collins. Um, and one thing that's contributing to that is um, the sentence structure um, and the way that we're shifting between description, uh, describing describing concepts and phenomena versus narrating actions, where we're seeing more, more action verbs. Um, similarly, all those questions um, mostly don't have those helping verbs in there. Um, and that'll be something I might think about uh, talking about. Prepositional phrases, not a lot. Um, yeah, not a lot happening in these in this writing overall. Um, for me, if I was um, going to be writing about this, I think probably the key thing that I would be looking at would be maybe these prepositional phrases as um, preambles. Um, so in mine, as I talked about already, um, we have that uh, citational work getting done. Um, up here in Collins, um, he's giving us information, like background information. Um, and it is kind of a citation, but it's a citation to his, it's referencing his work, right? His experience working with these tools. Um, 
Whereas we have other sentences where we have stuff leading in where it's not really saying as much related to this. You could work that out from other things. Um, one reason that I would think about writing about that for this particular assignment is that um, we would normally expect to see more of that kind of citational construction, like attributing uh, words and statements and claims to other people when academic writing. Um, whereas this one is relatively little and it is because of that medium um, and format that it was intended to be a dialogue and interview and it was recorded from a verbal interview versus us writing it down. Um, so it's really foregrounding our voices rather than other people's voices. Um, and you can see that even without even where I've taken all the quotes out already. And so that would probably be the other thing that I would be um, would be thinking about when I was, uh, yeah, if I was putting together this, this assignment. So for me, looking at this, if I were writing an essay on this, my advice to you is you always, you don't need to write about all the data you have. Um, if you try and write about all the data you have in 900 words, it's going to be too much. So it's 100% okay for you to narrow your scope um, um, so that you can focus in on the stuff that's I important, you know, if, if everything's the same, you know, why would you talk about it? Um, um, yeah, so have a think about what it is you feel like you have stuff to say about and also about where you feel most confident in making an argument, where you have the best data or the stuff that you most would be confident quoting. Um, for a 900 word essay, uh, a thousand words, right? Um, you're probably looking at making three points. Word count is a proxy for the number of points people expect you to make. Um, yeah, so have a think about which ones you would want to do. For me, uh, looking at this data set, I think I would I would talk about those patterns in sentence length um, because I do have a heap to say about that, as you've heard, um, about the um, yeah the distribution of sentence length and the way those shorter and longer sentences are being used um, to serve different functions within the text. Um, I I would probably also talk about those prepositional phrases um, just because that citation-y one is kind of interesting and important for that genre um, and it is different than what you would expect for this genre as well, right? Um, there's relatively little citation stuff happening. I'd probably do that. Um, and it lets you tie into that coherence part of the picture. Um, I would probably not talk about the kicker as actor stuff, um, just because like, how boring is it to say all of the sentences are in the active voice? Like, great, now what, right? Um, yeah, I would probably skip that one and focus my attention in those. Um, in terms of an outline, you know, you are presenting your data, um, that data overview, um, but then come down and use the um, come down and use the quotes in your close reading of the text in order to substantiate that, to make it real. Um, remember that your coding doesn't form part of your essay, it's part of your submission, but think of it like an appendix, right? Good to know, but not have to know. Um, so we should be able to understand your point and understand your data from the essay. Um, we uh, and then we go back and we can access the coding, we can refer to the coding, you can say in sentence 9, Colin does whatever, um, especially if you don't want to quote it, right? Um, but you do need to bring that data into the essay, right? It's not a standalone thing, it needs to form part of the essay. Um, thinking about your introduction, there's a place where you might be thinking about the genre and the audience and the context um, because that will inform anything you want to say about those stylistic and rhetorical effects, right? What works for one audience won't necessarily work for another um, and you would expect to see the context, the audience, the medium affecting 
those written those writing choices. Um, so your introduction could um, set up for that. Give you an overview. Teach your reader how to read the document so that they understand what's coming and what to expect in their assignment. Um, present your overview. Make your argument and your analysis. Um, and then give us, you know, that neat little summary conclusion that wraps it up. Tells us, uh, tells us what the big takeaways are um, and lets us understand uh, what the point is that you've made. So there you go, I hope that's helped. Um, like I said, this is how my brain works. That coding scheme may be a little bit different to what works for you, that's fine. Give us a key, help us understand how your brain works. Um, you do have to include your coding, you have to include your chart, um, all as part of your submission, but our, our focus is on the, on the essay. Um, it's okay if you make like, odd mistakes here and you'll see in my coding I've made mistakes. Um, I put a little comment here about a verb that I noticed on like my third pass through this thing um, that I'd missed the first time around because I was just ignoring everything in brackets. Um, what I would say is if there's something you're like really not confident about that's fine. Maybe don't use it as a quote um, but um, you know put it into your put it into your chart. If there's one thing that you're not one verb that you're not sure if it's a verb, um, it has a relatively low impact if it's one of nineteen verbs in the data set. But it has a pretty high impact if it's one of one examples in your in your essay. Um, so have a think about um, God, sorry, it's so annoying. Um, yeah, have a think about um, the best evidence that you can provide to make your points. Um, yeah, reach out with questions. Let us put them in the FAQs. Um, don't forget that you will get a chance to review this work with um, a peer in our peer review workshop. Um, so you'll have your draft, yeah, another set of eyes on this as well. Um, yeah, have fun. It is a fun assignment. It's kind of cool to see all this stuff. Um, and there's only this one way to see it. So from me and Dr. Andy, happy coding, happy writing. Um, yeah, and we can't wait to see your work. Okay, so in this part of the video, what I'm gonna do is just a quick comparison to see how ChatGPT does with this assignment prompt. Um, what I've seen in the past is that it typically does not do awesome, but I want to do a really direct comparison um, with some authentic examples. Um, so here's one I prepared earlier. Okay, so this is my redo of can ChatGPT do this assignment? And uh, what I'm here to tell you is that ChatGPT has not gotten better at doing this assignment since the last time I did this. Um, and overall, what I would say to you is that it took me as much time to check ChatGPT's work uh, as it would have done to do this assignment myself. Um, I did record the whole thing, but again, just my face, not my video. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is just take you through the ChatGPT output because I cannot be bothered to recode the entire thing again. Um, and because I did not save my coding from when I did it. I've still got the markup, but I didn't, I cleared the sheet. Um, so what I did was I grabbed this piece of journalistic writing from um, today, uh, this first couple of paragraphs of um, this news article about AI opportunities and risk. Um, then I went to ChatGPT. Um, I, um, so here's my first uh, round through it. Asked it to give us the, the number of words in the text, 121. Asked it again, new piece of text, the exact same one, 134. So it's already not going great. Um, if you put it into Word, uh, it is 137. Um, um, that was my first one. Um, I did then get it to do 
the entire, every single row of that table. Um, how many words are in this text? Copy paste the same thing. 141, so wrong again. Um, it did keep saying 141 this time, which I guess is better than saying random stuff last time. Um, but still wrong, so not a lot of help. Um, number of... Doo -doo -doo. I kept doing it to see if it would be wrong again, but it didn't. Um, number of sentences in that text. It says five. Um, actually, it is six. So one, liberals on the front line, two, three, ends it harder, four, five, six. Like you can't even count, you know, much less do the rest of it. This is why I don't want to redo it because it was um, just so consistently wrong. Um, a quiet revolution is going on that threatens to change everything in our lives and oddly there's disturbing little national debate about what we could do about it. Um, so it is actually wrong about how many words are in it. Um, I think I said this in the other video but word if you put the numbers in it always counts one too high so it was 30 in total. Um, it was the longest sentence, but no, second longest sentence. This is actually our longest sentence up here, 35 words in sentence number one. Um, so again, not just wrong, but can't count. Um, um, shorter sentence, also wrong. Um, the main verbs, um, here's my markup. Um, so yellow ones, talked up, phrasal verb, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. How many total forms are uh, forms of to be? This one, uh, I was actually kind of confused what I was saying here. Um, there we go. Um, I was confused what it meant here because there are six forms that are forms of to be, this question marky stuff. Um, I initially thought it was kind of clarifying um, and that it was meant to be, why doesn't that voice, I don't know. Um, I thought that would go away. Um, yes, there we go. Um, yeah, I initially thought this was clarifying, like what are the forms of to be? Um, and then I was like, well, we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's the forms of to be that are in this piece of writing. Um, but if so, it's wrong about that as well. Um, how many of these are used as main verbs? Um, it says four. Um, again, as you can see, right, factually incorrect. Here's a form of to be. Um, that was not in that list. Um, total number that get used as um, main verbs. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Um, you ask it which ones. Um, yeah, is not getting that right either. Um, you can see it's not even the same sentence, right? Was that their jobs were on the line. Uh, and it's example there, one was on the line. Like the text doesn't even appear in the sample. Um, is going on. Yeah. Um, where going on is our main verb, is is a helping verb. Um, prepositional phrases, uh, it's a 10. Um, what did I say? One, two, three, four, five. I mean, five in two sentences already tells you it's not ten, right? Um, it could do this maths. Ten divided by five. Um, the kicker is actor stuff really through it. Um, kind of predictably, right? Because this is non-standard terminology. Um, terminology that we're using 
in this chart in order to kind of get a point across. Um, yeah, and that in turn messed it up. In, if we're thinking about those active voice sentences, um, yeah, or linking verbs where the subject is before the linking verb, um, then, um, yeah, again, factually incorrect. Um, a form of to be as the most important verb. Um, yeah, this one's true. One sentence, the truth is politics is consumed. Um, yeah, I would give it that. Um, but also I think it should be listed up here. Um, total number of words preceding the subject in each sentence is a mess and I'm just going to highlight one of these here. Innovation became code for dangerous change according to liberals on the front line. Nine words preceding the subject of the sentence allegedly. This is the entire sentence and also there are 12 words in it, not nine. So, awesome. Um, yeah, again, I can do the averagey stuff, but like all this stuff is wrong. Um, when we start asking to make judgment calls, how many of these words are necessary for text coherence? What we get is this hand wavy, this can be subjective, dependent on the context and style of writing, which is true. You know about the style and the context, and that's why you are in a position to make these claims. Um, in general, the words preceding the subject in each sentence, again, it's a judgment call. You need to be able to say this and you need to be able to back up your claim. Um, yeah, and then you come down into these very hedgy terms, right? It's safe to say that a significant portion of them play whatever. Like, again, what's the significant portion? Which ones? Uh, it's just hedgy. It's not telling us anything. It's not making a case. It's not using evidence. Um, this bit, um, it's a bit dicey, so I fed it, oh there you go, I fed it my table of data, so you can actually see, um, here is my manual coding, uh, this column here, um, versus, uh, ChatGPT's coding, um, um, you can see there are some pretty substantial differences here, right, our prepositional phrases were big, the word counts, the sentence counts, um, the coherent stuff I just left empty for ChatGPT because it just gave us the shoggy emoji. So I did give it the chart comparing my count to its count. Um, if I had fed it a sample where it was about two different texts, I don't think we would have gotten substantively different things. It thinks it's about two texts. Um, some stuff that's kind of screwy. So the rhetorical and stylistic analysis of the text that it spits out. Um, you could tidy this up with like a more detailed prompt, please write an essay that's got X, Y, and Z characteristics, but you would still have the underlying problem, which is the data is bad and the claims are consequently bad and also confusing um, and hedged, not specific to the text either. Um, so what it sp spits out is kind of an outline. Um, some things that stick out to me about this, um, this word count thing only refers to half of the data, um, so one of the texts, not both of the texts. Um, this bit about a moderate length of sentences, um, what is moderate? Um, the average, like I talked about in the first video, first video was um, the average by itself doesn't tell you anything about the length and the distribution, the distribution of lengths. Um, it could be very short and very long. It could all be medium or it could be around the average. You don't know without looking at the text. Um, can contribute to readability and clarity, sure, maybe. Um, in general, um, people who subscribe to readability maths do think that um, shorter sentences are more readable. There's not good data that they're more usable or clearer. Um, and it all depends on the genre and the context, right? Yeah, in a piece of academic writing, shorter is not necessarily better. 
Um, maybe you're not trying to be clear. Maybe you're trying to um, put together something very complicated that can't be concise. Maybe you're trying to put yourself in the mind of someone who's confused and create that effect on the reader. It's hard to know. Um, from the main verbs, um, again, from just looking at the data, you cannot tell some of this stuff, right? Um, the number of verbs has nothing to do with the amount of variety. It also has nothing to do with action versus linking verbs just from that data set. You need to go to the samples to find, find out what's going on. Um, likewise, a similar number of to be verbs. Um, it's just recapping the data here and then giving us that very generic statement. Verbs are essential for indicating states of being and relationships between elements in the text. Like, okay, sure, that's a definition, um, but what's actually happening in the, what's actually happening in the text? Is it about states? Is it about tense? Is it about description? Um, so what, why does that matter? Um, and again, I think you can get the, get the gist here, our prepositional phrases, detail, context. Yeah, maybe, again, maybe that's happening, maybe it's not. Um, and again, so what? Um, sentence structure and complexity. Uh, I'll say first up, this is out of scope for this assignment. Um, we do talk about sentence uh, structure for assignment two. Um, and that will be something you're looking at. So a complex sentence is technical vocabulary. Um, and so a more complex sentence structure doesn't really mean anything. It's complex or it's not. Um, again, out of scope for this assignment. There is no inherent relationship between sentence type, so complex versus simple, and sentence length. Um, yeah, so there's no way to know this. Um, longer sentence in both samples contains a similar number of words, showing the ability to construct detailed and informative sentences. Um, Yeah, look, again, is the detail in there? Is it informative? Uh, is it a long sentence that says pretty much nothing? Is it the word um 17 times? Who knows? Um, yeah, the kicker versus actor bit, it, again, very confused and didn't it say that there were no sentences where the act, oh, no sentences where the action is kicking as distinct from the kicker being the actor. Um, the percentage of sentences where action is a to be verb um, is higher, suggesting a slightly different approach to using linking verbs to connect, convey action. Um, and here it's, I mean, clearly gotten turned around with the terminology, right? Um, linking verbs um, convey description, not action. Um, if it's um, if we've got forms of to be as helping verbs and it's connecting into action, but um, text coherence, uh, I didn't put anything for that in the title, um, um, in the table, uh, could imply that, whatever, like, again, sure, could it, does it, that's a different thing. Um, it then just gives us this very hand wavy conclusion demonstrate effective use of rhetorical and stylistic elements to convey meaning and engage the reader. Um, nothing in there has told us anything about engaging the reader um, or really about conveying meaning in these specific cases. Um, you do need to be thinking about the reader and the audience in order to make those claims. Um, it also introduces new terminology of coherent strategies, which I had never heard of and didn't ask it about, um, but I asked and it gave me this list of just kind of generic stuff and I don't know if any of it really is meant to apply to this, I think it's just, yeah, in all, uh, this would not be a passing assignment in this class. Um, a, the data is wrong, B, the data is not being used effectively. C, it's not connecting into um, ideas taught in class. D, when you get into this essay, where is it? Um, alleged essay. A, it doesn't have the structure of an essay. Um, B, it just kind of 
recaps the table and then says, gives us that hedged claim, right? This might suggest that, this suggests that, this may indicate that. Um, so they're not making any claims about the data, um, not backing those up with evidence from the text. So we're only getting that high level, not that close one, um, and really not presenting any kind of an argument. It's really just descriptive. Um, so this would be, yeah, certainly a failing grade in this class because it just doesn't meet the assignment requirements. What I would say to you all about doing this, um, you know, I did go through and code this, um, as you have to, right? ChatGPT can make mistakes. Consider checking important information. Um, it took me at le it took me as long to go through and code this as um, yeah to check ChatGPT's work as it did would have done to just code it in the first place. Um, uh, it would also take me even longer to write the essay accompanying this. So even if I wanted to stick with that outline that it's given us, um, because I hadn't actually spent the time with the text, um, you know, you saw when I made the first video, um, like the real one where I did it myself from scratch, um, was that as I was coding, I was spotting stuff um, that I could, um, you know, look at all these short sentences, look how they're questions, look how the verbs are different in them. Um, that I was familiar enough with the text to be able to start to make those claims and those arguments to start with, um, which set me up to be able to do the essay. Whereas if I started from that, I would then have to go to the text, A, code it all to check it, um, B, start thinking about all those connections. Um, in all, um, what I would say is that this, um, yeah, this tool is not going to help you out that much with this assignment. Um, you're not working with stuff that's um, highly predictable. Um, you are not working with stuff that's uh, available on the internet um, and so likely to have been scraped into those data sets. Um, because the point is to be able to make that argument, you need to be working with um, that kind of close reading of the data and making your own judgment calls. Um, yeah. Um, and the only thing I would say is that this has not gotten better. Um, you know, this is, well, it's, a th it's the second time today I've tried to make it do this assignment. Um, it is, uh, I did it last year as well. Um, and it was all the same, the same issues. Um, including stuff that you would really think this, these technologies could do, like how many spaces is it? Um, uh, how many words is it? You know, if you were, you could program something to tell you that really easily, you know, where are the spaces between words in English? Um, but because these, um, these technologies are intended to just kind of do that predictive text stuff, um, it's not actually working with working with that data, right? Um, and consequently, you're getting really screwy readings of the text, or well, readings of the text, scare quotes on that. Um, yeah, so my very strong advice to you would be, it is worth trying to work this out yourself. Um, and it will probably be about the same amount of time and less frustrating if you do it yourself. Um, as well as setting you up to be able to do the next assignment, which really relies on your ability to um, identify verbs. You can't do the next assignment unless you can identify those verbs. So doing it here, getting some feedback. Um, yeah, learning from that feedback if your verb identification doesn't go awesome um, because it's the first time you're really doing it at length, um, will set you up for that next assignment as well. Okay, folks, so uh, I'm back after um, completing the rest of that coding and then also having a Zoom meeting and also Dr. Andy has joined us, Antoinette, Samantha Kerr, um, and she loves to press buttons, so um, 
we'll see whether she accidentally pauses my video. Um, but I don't want to put her down because she's been eating stuff in my office. Um, okay, so as you can see here, I've completed the rest of this um, uh, coding for Colin's text. 